Good morning. I'm Anna, one of the pastors here at Cokesbury. I'm so glad to see you all who are here with us on campus and glad that all of you are joining us online. We're so glad to have all of you today. And today is Mother's Day, so I want to say Happy Mother's Day to all of you who are mothers. Um, And I want to also acknowledge that sometimes, while for some of us, Mother's Day is the best and it's super special, for others of us, Mother's Day is really hard for a number of reasons. Because maybe you have lost a mother or a child, or you're estranged from a mother or a child, or your dream of being a mother hasn't turned out the way that you wanted. There's a million reasons why this might be a hard day. So I just want to tell you, however you're feeling is exactly where God is meeting you today. So we are glad that you're here. You don't have to feel any sort of way to be here and fit in. You can be having a great day or a bad day and God meets you here just the same. And we're glad you're here just the same. So I'm honored to be with each of you and I wanna open us in prayer as we get into God's word today. God, thank you for another day of life. Help us, God, not to take a single moment that you give us for granted. God, I thank you for the people gathered here both on campus and online and the people that'll join us later today and throughout the week, I just ask for your special blessing on each and every one of us that you would open up our hearts to hear the word that you would give us today, that we would come out of this time closer to you, closer to each other, and taking next steps in our walk with you. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen. I have never ever been good at endings. I love the beginning of things. I love the beginning of school and all the excitement that builds. I love the preparation for something new, but I'm really bad at the end of things when you get to like a graduation or you get to the end of camp or the end of vacation or the end of some special thing or special season. I'll just be honest, it bums me out. (laughs) I think it's sad. When something cool happens or something good is going or a group of people bond, I just want that to just stay forever. I would just never ever let it go and I hold on to it probably to a fault. But it's tough for me because when something really good happens, you want to keep enjoying it, but that is not how life works. And I will say that's something that no one tells you about parenting. So if you have not been a parent yet or you haven't experienced that part of the journey, just let me just kind of warn you that parenting is a lot of letting go. It's a series of letting go, a series of endings. And when I was pregnant with our first child, I, would, I had what I would call probably like an easy pregnancy. Everything went pretty well. I mean, you know, the normal things like, you know, you're hot and your back hurts and you don't sleep well, the normal pregnancy stuff. But it was pretty easy, all things in, taken into consideration. It was pretty great. And I loved being pregnant. I loved feeling the baby kick. I loved talking to him. I loved all of that. And then he was born and we were like over the moon, overjoyed, best day. Um, It was incredible. He was born early on a Sunday morning and a little bit after that, we were sent home with this incredible baby. And so I'm still just cloud nine, you know, we're exhausted, but everything's great. And there was some family member over at the house, you know, my mom or my mother-in-law, somebody, and they were holding the baby and I was in the living room and they left the room with the baby normal thing to do, right? They're not taking the baby. I think they were walking into the kitchen. I felt myself sit up in my chair and I'm tense. And my my honest thought was, where are they taking him? And I was like, whoa, hey, take a step back, Anna. Maybe take a breath. Didn't say it out loud, thankfully. That would have been a little weird and awkward. But it was my first realization that this part of my heart, myself, is now on the outside and it's gonna go out into the world. Nobody had ever said it like that before and I had never considered it. And it was my first realization that that is a lot of what parenting is, is a constant stream of next steps. This constant stream of loving someone and caring for them, but blessing them into the world farther and farther and farther. And raising him and his sister has been this just parade already in the short decade that I have been a parent that they are becoming more and more independent and every new season we are sending them a little farther out. They're a little more themselves, they're a little more independent. And I'll just be honest, it is hard. It's hard, it's hard for me to experience that process of letting go. There's some grief in that. 
Our, my oldest niece, our family's first baby, is graduating from high school this Friday. I know a lot of you are in this season. I've been seeing so many of you sending your kiddos off to prom or getting ready for graduation. Some of them are prepping to go to college and it is incredible and we are all overjoyed for her and it's the dream, right? You, you dream of getting to experience these milestones with your nieces and your nephews and your kids and your grandkids and your neighbors, but it's hard. <laughs> It's hard to watch them take those next steps, but to get that awesome new thing, to get that milestone, to experience that next thing, you have to let go of something else. There's something behind that you had to let go of. When, before we even had kids, I dreamed about getting to watch my kids ride a bike or go off to school. But for my child to be able to ride a bike or go off to school, they have to get to that age where they stop needing me to rock them to sleep and they're now too big to need to be carried up the stairs, right? To get that thing you're looking forward to, it means that you've got to let go of something else. And we talk at Cokesbury all the time about next steps. If you are new here, I'm really glad you came, and you're getting the next step um, speech right off, right? Like, I'm, I'm already giving it, you're, you're hearing it, and it's gonna be familiar to you if you keep coming back here, because you'll hear it in Songs, you'll hear it when we make announcements, you'll hear it in messages when we are preaching the Bible. This idea that our life is about next steps, but to take a next step always means to leave something else behind. Physically, taking a next step forward means that there are steps that are behind you that you have to leave behind. And sometimes the thing that you leave behind is something that you love, something that is awesome, you cherish it, but to grow, you're gonna have to be able to let it go a little bit. Other times, to take a next step means that you leave behind something that is actually harmful, that you're walking away from something that is painful or difficult or harming you, but just because something's harmful to us doesn't make it easy to walk it away from. Have you had that experience? Something that you know is not great for you or is not the season that you wanna be in and somehow it's just more comfortable to stay there than it is to take a next step. So taking next steps while exciting, important, all of those things is difficult. What would happen if there was a caterpillar that was like, you know what, I dig being a caterpillar. I think I'm just gonna do, the, I'm great at it. I eat all day, not terrible. You know, I, I'm good at this. I mean, I also would like to be a butterfly, but I'll just keep on being a caterpillar. It does not work that way. To get to the cocoon, the chrysalis, the butterfly, that caterpillar's gotta stop being a caterpillar. It's over. That phase is over. Because to have transformation, to be a new creation in Jesus, it means that we have to leave something behind. This series is called Easter People. And in the light of the empty tomb and the resurrection of Jesus, we are looking into scripture at the Easter people, the people whose lives got turned upside down by being a part of this story, by seeing the resurrected Jesus, by experiencing the empty tomb. And so we are trying to figure out what can we learn about following Jesus by walking in their shoes. So today we're gonna be talking about Mary Magdalene. She is a woman with a checkered past, some would say. She had a lot of difficulties in her life, which we'll hear about, but her life was changed by Jesus. But she's also the very first person to interact with the resurrected Jesus. She is the first person to hear and fully understand the news of the resurrection. She's the first evangelist. She is the first one to deliver the message. She is the first Easter person. So we first meet Mary Magdalene back in Luke chapter eight, verses one through three. Luke tells us about her that soon afterwards, Jesus went on through cities and villages proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. So this is the time where Jesus is going around and preaching and teaching. So Luke has been telling us about that. The 12 were with him, the disciples, as well as some women who had been cured of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called Magdalene from whom seven demons had gone out and Joanna and Susanna and many others who provided for Jesus and the disciples out of their resources. So Luke tells us that Mary Magdalene is kind of in the crew. She is part of the followers of Jesus. You've got his core 12 disciples and you've got these other people who are sort of in the orbit, who are traveling around with them. Mary Magdalene being one of them, she has had a miraculous encounter with God through Jesus. 
She has been healed of these seven demons, these seven spirits, and then, as you would not be surprised, she becomes one of Jesus' followers. Because for her, the story of Jesus, this idea that Jesus can connect you to God, can give you freedom and hope, this is not abstract to her, this is very real. She has experienced this in her own life. Her testimony is already deep and full of stories, even when we meet her. So Mary Magdalene, becomes a follower of Jesus, a friend of Jesus. She is walking alongside him. She's sharing meals with him. She's hearing him teach and preach. And it says that she's also helping out, that she and these other people who are following along are doing what they can to provide for the needs. You think if this group of people is traveling around with Jesus, there's gonna be needs for meals and shelter and all kinds of things that have to be worked out. So it says that she and some of the others are making sure those needs are provided for. I would love just to have had an afternoon to watch that group. Just to, just to be at a distance, just watching this all take place. I wonder, did like Mary and Jesus, did they have an, an inside joke? Or did they have a knowing look that they exchanged when somebody mentioned something about her past that was still hard for her to deal with? But he knew, he knew what she was feeling and they could, it, you know how you can do that with your friends? You can just exchange a look and you can give each other comfort and encouragement because Jesus saw that transformation that had happened in her life. He was the bringer of that transformation. He was on the front row. He was the one there with her. And when you share that kind of history with somebody, it is so powerful. It can be so comforting. And I wonder, were there certain things that Mary Magdalene always did? Like, did she have a specific role in the group? Was she really good at one thing or another? And there was something that she always took care of. I just imagine her sitting and listening to Jesus and just hanging on every word that he said, knowing that this was the real deal, knowing that this was really something special. We see Mary Magdalene again on the day of crucifixion. Mark tells us about this in chapter 15, starting in verse 40. Mark said, there were also women looking on from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, the younger, and of Joseph and Salome. These used to follow him and provided for him when he was in Galilee. And there were many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem. Now you might remember there were a lot of people who scattered at the crucifixion, a lot of people who didn't stay. But Mary Magdalene is one that just can't take her eyes off what's happening. As horrible as it was, as painful as it was, as dangerous as it was for all of them, she's standing at a distance and she's bearing witness to what's happening. They stay near to Jesus even while Jesus is on the cross, but then he's crucified. In Matthew 27, we read that Mary Magdalene watched as Joseph of Arimathea laid Jesus in a borrowed tomb. She stayed until the bitter end. And y'all, that weekend was dark. It was full of unimaginable pain and loss and then fear on top of all of that. But then Sunday came. And there's several accounts of what happened on that morning. I love John's account. I love, he's such a storyteller. I love the way that he tells you and what happens and the details that he includes. So we're gonna hear John's version, starting in verse 20. John says, early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed. For as yet they didn't understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. So they believe that Jesus is not in the tomb anymore. They believe that something incredible has happened, but they're still trying to put all the pieces together. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she bent over to look in the tomb and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord and I don't know where they have laid him. And when she had said this, she turned around and she actually saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? 
thinking that he was probably the gardener. She said to him, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. He speaks her name. She turned to him and in Hebrew, rabbinite, which means teacher, is what she said back to him. Jesus said to her, don't hold on to me because I've not yet ascended to the Father, but go and tell my brothers and say to them, I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Wow, <laughs> what an incredible story that Mary Magdalene gets to be a part of this first Easter morning, the day that changed the course of all of human history that changed the world forever. And it's still dark when Mary Magdalene gets up on Sunday morning and you wonder, has she been sleeping? Are her eyes still puffy from crying? What, what's she been doing throughout the weekend? How's she been feeling? But she goes to the tomb and it's empty. And see, sometimes for us, we go through Holy Week and we remember Good Friday and then there's Holy Saturday. And then when we walk in here or tune in on Easter Sunday morning, we're like, the tomb is empty, good news, right? But for Mary Magdalene and the others, the empty tomb, the tomb being empty did not immediately translate to good news. There was a few steps there in between. For us, empty tomb, immediately resurrection of Jesus. We are so excited, we are so thankful, we are praising God and worshiping. For the people who are living that in real time, they think empty tomb, stolen body. That's, that's the, the sequence that they're in at this point. And she immediately goes and tells Peter and John, they come and they believe that Jesus is not there, but they're still trying to figure out what all this means. It says that then they just went home, <laughs> right? Because they're trying to process all of what this means. But Mary stays and she's crying outside the tomb, but she still does not see this as a miracle. Mary Magdalene still sees this as a tragedy. And then... She sees Jesus face to face, and it's, at first she just assumes that it's the gardener. It is, her mind hasn't even grasped the possibility that that could be Jesus, because she saw Jesus die. She saw him go in the tomb. She saw that stone be closed off. So even when the evidence begins to present itself that the tomb has been, the stone's been rolled away, the tomb is empty, when she sees him, she assumes it's the gardener. But then, do you remember what Jesus did? He called her by her name. Jesus says, Mary, and everything she knows in that moment gets flipped upside down. I can't even imagine like the flood of emotion she's feeling from like the absolute pit of despair to the absolute height of joy. It's like she's probably dizzy from just like the complete flip around that's happening. And when she sees him, you know what she first thinks? Everything has gone back to normal. And she's so excited. Because what she's been thinking this whole time is that if only that had never happened, if only we had done something, if only there had been another way. So she's like, yes, awesome, you're back. And she goes to reach for him, just like any of us would. If you see a person that's so important to you and you think that they're dead and they're not, you, you reach out for them. And when she goes in to throw her arms around Jesus, Jesus goes, no, 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 don't, don't touch me. Remember in the scripture it said, don't hold on to me because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene becomes the first one to see the resurrected Jesus face to face. But one of my favorite authors, Frederick Beekner, talks about the experience that Mary might have been having this way. Here's what he says. Mary Magdalene became the first person in the world to have her heart stop beating for a second to find Jesus alive again when she thought he was dead as a doornail. But the first person also to have her heart break just a little, to realize that he couldn't be hugged anymore, wasn't there anymore as a hand to hold on to when the going got tough, a shoulder to weep on, because the life in him was no longer a life she could know by touching it, with her here and him there, but a life she could now only know by living it with her here and him here too, alive inside her, to raise her up out of the wreckage that was her life. When Mary Magdalene knew Jesus had been crucified and put in the tomb, she's praying and hoping and wishing this had all been a dream, that none of this has ever happened, that everything could just go back the way that it was. And when she saw Jesus, she assumes the nightmare is over. 
It didn't happen. We can, we can forget about it. We can just erase all of that. But Mary Magdalene was actually dreaming a little bit too small. Because to her in that moment, the miracle was that the crucifixion didn't happen, that Jesus never died. He's still here. It's okay. He's back. Because what she finds out, though, is that the miracle is not that the crucifixion never happened, that things are back to normal. The miracle was that it had happened and that nothing would ever be the same again. And that's the catch. Nothing will ever, ever be the same again. Mary Magdalene, the first Easter person, had to come to the realization that nothing is ever gonna be the same again. Now, certainly, things were gonna be better. Things were gonna be incredibly better, in fact, because, because of Jesus' death and resurrection, she was soon gonna be among the people who received the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God and Jesus was gonna live inside her, give her freedom and hope. She would get to be with Jesus, not just in her life, but into eternity that she would have a path to be reconciled to God. It's incredible, it's the best news there could be, but it meant for Mary Magdalene and for some of the others that her daily life was actually gonna change quite a bit. Her friend, her mentor, her teacher was not gonna be there by their side in the same way anymore. Things were not gonna be the same. And we can look at that and go, Mary Magdalene, look, look at the facts, like don't be sad, don't be disappointed that your friend Jesus is not gonna be there every day. Look at what you're getting instead, right? Like eternity, salvation, freedom, all of these things. And it's easy for us to say that, I think, on this side of the story, but we are all like this. We do this same thing with Jesus, actually. It plays out a little differently because we weren't there in person with him, but so often, we come to Jesus, we meet Jesus, and we want Jesus just to come into our life and like make our life better. Right? We want Jesus to cut, like, yes, I would love to follow Jesus. And Jesus, if you could come and just like give us a glow up, right? Like, give us a tune up. Like, just make our life shinier and prettier and easier and better. And yet, freedom, absolutely want that. Hope, joy, yep, yep. Check, check, check. We want Jesus often to help us put everything back in our life the way it was before it got hard, for whatever reason made our life hard. We want Jesus to put our life back the way it was before the addiction, before the debt, before the life plan got derailed for whatever reason, before the relationship got broken. We want Jesus to just take us and push rewind and go back like it never happened. Just like Mary Magdalene, we're like, you know what, the best thing that could happen here is let's just go back. Let's don't do the crucifixion. Let's don't do the trauma. Let's don't do all those hard things that happen in our life, but next steps are not about reclaiming the past. Being a Christian is not asking Jesus to like loop back. If we could just like loop back on what happened before and maybe fix that or make it to where it never happened, following Jesus is actually about a new life, a transformed life, a new purpose. Taking a next step forward with Jesus often means letting something else go, leaving something else behind. In Luke's account of that first morning when Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb, he talks also, just like John does, about the two angels that she hears from. But in Luke 24, 5, he says that one of the angels said to Mary, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Why do we do that? Why do we keep trying to look for the living among the dead? Why do we keep going back to the dead things in our life and keep saying, no, no, we, we can make this work? We, like Mary Magdalene, are often dreaming too small. She was limited by her own human understanding, as are we, and she thought the miracle was putting everything back like it was. Jesus was doing something much, much bigger than that. Jesus had been sent to make a new life, a new world, to do something brand new. And as people living on this side of Easter, we can start to expect God to do some pretty big things. I think some of us have been praying a little small, have been praying God just make it go away, God put it back, God make it like it never happened. The slogan for recovery way back in the day used to be get your life back until years ago, somebody brilliant, I don't know who it was, maybe Mark, maybe it was you, but said, 
we don't want our life back because the life that we were living was broken. The life that we were living was steeped in sin, was separated from God. We don't want that life back. What we're actually praying for is a brand new life. I don't want my old life back. I don't wanna hit rewind and just drop God into my life earlier and say, well, now we'll just play the story back and it'll be better, right, because I'll know God. That's not what we want. Jesus didn't come to give us our old life back. He came to give us a new life. But so many of us, even those of us who are Christians, keep clinging and clawing to the old parts of us. We go, God, I hear you, love the new life stuff, but there's just this one part of me I'm super attached to, really wanna hang on to that. And God is like, no, get rid of it. We're having a yard sale, everything goes. We are starting over. I don't know if you've ever renovated anything. Some of you are so good at this, and I am so jealous that there are people that have this skill. I'm not one of those people. But like you go into a house and it has wallpaper, Right, and some people are like, ah, it's fine, we'll just, we'll just paint over it, right? We'll just, we'll, we can stay, it can stay. And then you get, you know, three, four coats of paint in and you realize like, that was, that was a poor choice. We should have taken the wallpaper down. God is not looking to come into your life to just repaint, to just try to make things a little bit better because the miracle of the resurrection is actually that everything can go, that God can create an entirely new life in us that we can be fully forgiven of the sin that we carry around in our life, that if there are hurts and hangups in our life, that God can work in those and through those to heal those. I think about the recovery and addiction story in my own marriage, and I think there were days when the prayer was, God, I wish this had never happened. But the farther we got into our recovery story, we realized, you know what, I wouldn't wish this on anybody, but God has made something entirely new out of this that we never would have gotten if we hadn't experienced that. So it's the perspective on this side of the empty tomb that we can all look and go, you know what? There is a bigger miracle out there than God just repairing and shining up the things that are out of order. The bigger miracle is that God wants to give you an entirely new life, wants to give you a rebirth in Jesus Christ, to be a new person a person that reflects who he is. So I've got to ask us today as we are processing this story and we're thinking about this story through the eyes of Mary Magdalene, I've got to ask you, what are the things that you've got to let go of today in order to be able to walk forward with Jesus? Because see, if Mary Magdalene had, had closed her mind and said, no, I just want the old Jesus back I want the one who didn't have holes in his hands. I want the one who preached and taught and healed people. I just wanna keep doing that for the rest of my life. That's good enough. She would have missed out on the greatest miracle of all time. But instead, she meets the risen Jesus and she hears him call her by her own name. And Jesus calls her into this new life and says, it's gonna be different. It's gonna be different than what you had before. And I can't, tell you every detail about what's gonna happen. I'm not saying it's gonna be easy. Jesus is very clear about that with his early followers. Not saying it's gonna be easy, but he says to them, I am telling you, I'm never ever gonna leave you. I'm never gonna forsake you. I'm gonna be with you always. You're gonna have the power of the Holy Spirit within you. You're gonna have each other to lean on and have support and encouragement, but you're gonna have to let go of the past. You're gonna have to let go of your expectations. You're gonna have to let go of all the things you thought you knew. So today, I wanna ask us, what is it that we have to let go of? What is it that we have been clinging to so tightly, saying, God, I just need you to make this right in this certain way. What if we started to pray differently? Instead of saying, God, I want you to give me everything back the way it was, what if we open ourselves up today and go, God, I'm gonna have to turn it over to you because the new life, the next chapter, whatever it's gonna be, I don't even know what it is. But I trust you today that it's better than anything I could dream of. And I trust that you are gonna be tender with the pain, that you're gonna heal the trauma, that you're gonna give me tools and resources I need. It would have been much more comfortable for Mary Magdalene, much more comfortable for the disciples, 
much more comfortable for those people that ended up becoming martyrs for their faith. It would have been much more comfortable for them if the resurrection meant that the crucifixion was erased and that never happened. But comfortable is not what Jesus Christ came to this earth for. Jesus Christ came to this earth to give us new life, to save us from our sins, and to allow us to have eternity with him forever. Now, that tearing down of the old stuff is scary. It can feel sometimes like a free fall, but what we can trust is that God is building something new. And if we hang in, if we just keep walking forward with him, God is gonna continue to show us those building blocks of what that new life being built looks like. You can trust him in your next steps. So in a minute, we're gonna get a chance to pray. And Terry and Sydney and Noel are gonna come out and they're gonna sing and they're gonna lead us. And at that time, this area is gonna be open for you to pray. Now, this area is always open for you to pray, but I wanna make special time for that when we get to the end of our service. I wanna ask you, is there something that you need to bring down to this altar this morning? Is there something in your past that you've been clinging to that you need to come up today and let go of? Is there a version of plans that you've been clinging to saying, God, this is the way, I need you to help me make this happen. Is there a set of plans you need to come up and lay down and you know what, say, God, these may not be your plans. <laughs> these may have all been my creation, so open me up to what the new plan is. Open me up to what the new life is that you have for me. Help me to be available for this breaking down and this rebuilding. Y'all, it is often hard work. It is sometimes scary. It's certainly vulnerable, but it is the most worthwhile thing you'll do in your life is allowing yourself to be open enough with God to say, God, I wanna walk forward with you, whatever that means, whatever it looks like. I'm here and I trust you. And I may have to make that declaration a hundred more times to mean it. Uh, I'm gonna have to wake up every morning and keep trying. But God, today, I trust you. I trust the power of the resurrection. I don't want what I used to have, I want a new life. Let's pray. God, we are great planners. We know exactly what we want. And we ask forgiveness, God, for when we just try to tell you what you should do with our life. Today, God, help us to push that aside and say to you, God, I want what you want for me. I want what you want for my workplace and my friends and my church and my family. God, open us up. Give us the courage to take that next step in faith. I invite you now to come in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.